The second album that we're discussing this week is It's Only Rock and Roll. Uh, this album, as we said on the previous videos, recorded uh, in late 1973, early 1974 in Munich, uh, Germany, um, at a studio called Musicland Studios, where the, the group would actually return, as we said last week in the videos, return uh, again for more recording there after this project was finished. Anyway, they started Musicland in Munich, and then they, they also do work in London, um, and at Star Groves in London, they work um, they work at Olympic and uh, they uh, they work at Olympic Studios, a, a familiar uh, place uh, for them. Um, the album released in October 1974. Remember, we were talking in the previous video about the the fact that the two singles uh, from the album were you know not number one hits. And I said, well, but you know we want to make sure we we look at what's happening with the album and the way that it's charting. Well, as it turns out, when this album is released in October of 1974, it's number one in the U.S and number two in the UK. And that's really the measure of commercial success for a group like the Rolling Stones um, in this the first half of the 1970s. Uh, as we said before, um, Goat's Head Soup was the last album produced uh, by Jimmy Miller. And so now this one is produced by uh, uh, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards under the title, The Glimmer Twins. So whenever you see, you Fans probably already know this, but whenever you see the Glimmer Twins, uh, it refers to Jagger and Richards. This is Mick Taylor's last album with the band. He actually has some great stuff uh, happening uh, on this on this record. Um, so you'd never guess from listening to the record that he was fading out. You know, the last record that had Brian Jones on it, Let It Bleed. You know, Brian was barely there. Here, Mick is all over. Mick Taylor is all over uh, this record now. This began as an album that was going to be um, a single album with one side of it, all um, live recordings from the tour that they'd recently done, the European tour that they'd recently done. Um, and so the idea was one side would be live, and the other side would be uh, not new original material in the studio, but new covers they would do in the studio of some of their favorite uh, R&B, um, uh, artists and uh, the one that the, the the song that remains from this original idea of of the project is ain't too proud to beg. So think about this. This is what's in Keith Richards' mind. He wants a record that on one side is a live record and on another side has got cover tunes on it. Doesn't this seem to you like maybe somebody who's looking back to their roots? to the origins of their career, it may be a way of refreshing their interest in the group, or refreshing the group, or maybe thinking about new directions they can go in. In my Beatles course, I talk about this happening a couple times during their career, where they look back to their roots at just a point where they're starting to reorient uh, towards something new or something different. When things maybe start to get kind of samey or stale, it's time to look in new directions. So looking for the excitement of live performance and the cover versions, really resonates with a lot of the things that we've said about the, um, about the Rolling Stones. But they, they, they start to record, and it turns out, well, gosh, we've got all this material. And so they start recording up this original material, and pretty soon the idea of the half-live, half-cover versions record kind of falls away. All that's left of it is, uh, is Ain't Too Proud to Beg from the original uh, concept. Uh, the singles from this record, uh, as we said before, are It's Only Rock and Roll, getting only to number 16 in the US, number 10 in the UK, and Ain't Too Proud to Beg, making it only to number 17 in the US, but remembering the album went to number one in this country. The cover was designed and painted by a guy by the name of, uh, well, by a fellow by the name of Guy Pilert. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, probably not. But Guy Pilert um, was a, 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 a painter who'd done a book called Rock Dreams, and he'd also done the, um, the uh, album cover for David Bowie's Diamond Dogs, right? So um, he was somebody who was sort of circulating uh, in the, um, in the, the Rolling Stones uh, world in their orbit uh, at the time. Anyway, the album, It's Only Rock and Roll, as I said before, uh, produced by the Glimmer Twins and engineered uh, by Andy Johns, who's still part of the team uh, with recording here with some help from uh, Keith Harwood. As we said before, recorded at Musicland Studios in Munich, also at Stargroves uh, using the, the Rolling Stones mobile unit, um, and at Olympic uh, Studios. There's uh, 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 one track, Short and Curlies, which uh, sort of originates from the earlier album sessions for Goat's Head Soup and parts of that were recorded in Jamaica uh, and also at Olympic and Island Studios in London. So let's do as we've done before. 
Let's go through the tracks. Let's see how much of it's looking backward, how much, how much of it's looking forward, and maybe some of them. That's not even an important question to ask. So let's see how it turns out here. The first song, If You Can't Rock Me, is a guitar-driven rocker. Um, it features Keith on bass, and there's kind of a funk groove in the middle of this tune that's kind of similar to the funk groove in uh, Can't You Hear Me Knocking uh, from Sticky Fingers uh, from that point of view. But as a guitar-driven rocker, this is really the kind of thing that is really right down the middle of the plate for the Rolling Stones, something they've been doing uh, for a long time now. And so uh, it both looks backward and forward, I suppose. It's maybe neutral on that particular uh, issue. Of course, Ain't Too Proud to Beg, the cover that survives from the original concept of the record, um, very much a part of the group's uh, cover version uh, history uh, that, we, that was really a big part, especially of those first four albums and some of the singles. Um, the song was originally done uh, by The Temptations in 1966, and we'll come to that in our, um, in our uh, song close-up. For The Temptations, it had been a number 13 hit in 1966, number one uh, on the R&B charts. And this one, the guitar and the clavinet kind of replaced the berry sax and some of the horns on the original. Um, it's only rock and roll, but I like it. Um, it's kind of a boogie blues with a breakdown interlude. We'll talk about that when we do the song close up. In many ways, that breakdown interlude reminds me of Midnight Rambler, which, remember, we said was inspired by live performance, although it was difficult to do live. It was inspired by live performance. And considering they'd been thinking about making half the album a live album, that's probably why It's Only Rock and Roll was extended in this kind of live kind of way, getting a live in the studio uh, kind of feel uh, for the tune. Uh, Till the Next Goodbye, um, I think it's a singer-songwriter thing, a, a song with a, with a strong roots feel. Not quite country, but, uh, but uh, sounds, uh, sounds very rootsy. Maybe there's a, a bit of a Dylan-ish or New York songwriter uh, kind of uh, influence there. Uh, Time Waits for No One is a song that we'll talk about uh, in the song close to coming up. That really uh, displays a lot of jazz rock and also 70s soul influences. We'll talk about this as being sort of maybe the definitive Mick Taylor guitar solo uh, with the Rolling Stones. Uh, there's a track called Luxury, which has got strangely spare drumming. Funny when you listen to this track, the drums... I mean, everybody else's playing seems sort of full bore, but the drums are really sort of strangely spare. Uh, Mick does a kind of Jamaican accent, maybe reminds us a bit of Sweet Black Angel. Maybe there's a hint of Paul Simon in this tune. Remember the early 1970s, Paul Simon was doing things like, like Me and Julio down by the schoolyard, so maybe that kind of thing uh, works its way in. We'd have to compare dates to see whether there was any kind of a direct influence, but that's the kind of um, stylistic milieu I think that the Stones are, are, are working in here. So from that point of view, it, it really points in a kind of a, a newish direction, or at least a, a reflection of contemporary influences as opposed to looking back. Dance Little Sister, 50s rock all the way, not unlike Star Star uh, from the previous record, very much a kind of a Chuck Berry thing. So that would be one uh, that looks back. Uh, if you really want to be my friend, this is just Fantastic 60s soul with the backup, especially listen to those backup vocals. I mean, I think they may be so into the tune that they maybe let it go on, for my tastes, a little bit too long. It really do, kind of does the same thing over and over again. But again, if they're thinking about trying to create a kind of live in the studio kind of thing, they're stretching the song in the studio the way they might have stretched it live. So maybe that's part of what accounts uh, uh, for the exceptional length of the tune. I think it runs to about six minutes, when probably at four minutes it would have been just, just, just great. Anyway, very, very strong 60s soul influence. Again, uh, looking back. Short and Curly, so that's the song I mentioned, came from the Goats at uh, Soup Sessions. Uh, it's kind of a boogie blues with that kind of good time uh, jug band feel. There's a kind of a loose sing-along kind of feel uh, to that one. Um, fingerprint File. Um, it's uh, really kind of 70s funk, and um, I would look for influences of people like Sly Stone, Stevie Wonder, uh, Isaac Hayes, uh, as we talked about in Heartbreaker um, uh, from the, um, the, the last uh, record. And I would say this song, maybe more than any other song on the record, really looks forward to the song Hot Stuff 
which is going to be on the next album that the Rolling Stones bring out in 1976. So having had a, a, a look over this record, we've seen both things that look back into their, uh, their past, things that look uh, a little bit into their future, especially this last one, fingerprint file, and things that reflect a kind of influence of some of the kinds of things that were happening in the 70s around them. So very much like we saw in Go Ted Soup, um, let's have a closer look at some of the songs on this record to see how much this idea pans out. The song close-ups in the next video will be It's Only Rock and Roll, Time Waits for No One, Dance Little Sister, and Ain't Too Proud to Beg.